Hello, I'm Chris Hadnagy, Chief Human Hacker from Social Engineer LLC, also author of my most recent book, Social Engineering, The Science of Human Hacking. Today on Dove Baron Show, we'll talk about human hacking, what it is, how you're getting hacked each and every day through a lot of ishing words. You'll need to stay tuned to find out what those are. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dove Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty interview series. I'm your host and founder of Full Monty Leadership, Dov Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness so you can reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. Today, we're going to take an in-depth look at the crossover of social engineering and cybersecurity. Remember, you can chat about this episode or any episode of our shows on Facebook now in our private group, which is Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. Get yourself over there. If you're a new viewer, new listener, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. Remember, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, uh, or wherever you tune into podcasts, we also need your help in staying relevant. So please get yourself over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. When you do, please get back on that Facebook page, Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, Dove Baron, and tell us so that we can give you a shout out on the live show. Uh, you can also catch us on traditional radio stations across the United States every Monday and Thursday, all the way from Philadelphia to Georgia. Uh, <laughs> and if you are a regular listener, I want to thank you. Big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. And with a potential reach of uh, 2.5 to 4 million listeners for every show, we're honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. And by the way, you can also listen to us through Google Home and Alexa. Just simply say, play Dove Baron podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, someone in the C-suite, a sales leader, an entrepreneur, leader in any capacity, you know that cybersecurity has never been more important. But in a time where we as leaders are encouraged to allow our people online interactions, and for us to be more open and personal, where do we join the, draw, draw the line? Well, stay tuned because you're about to find out. Our guest on this episode is Chris Hagney. Now, he is the CEO of Social Engineering, where he is the chief human hacker. That use, he, he uses his powers for good to increase the security posture for organizations and provide security awareness trainings. He's also the founder of Innocent Lives Foundation, which helps track and capture predators who traffic and exploit children. Chris possesses over 17 years of experience as a practitioner of research in security field. His efforts in training, education, awareness have helped to explore, expose social engineering as a top threat to the security organizations of today. Chris specializes in understanding how the malicious attackers exploit human communication and trust to obtain access to information and resources throughout through manipulation and deceit. In addition, he holds certifications as an of offensive security certified professional OSCP and offensive security wireless professional OSWP. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome Chris Hagley. <laughs> <laughs> Good to have you here, Chris. Thanks. Good to be here, Dov. Thank you for joining us, mate. I really appreciate it. You know, I, I, 
I said in that intro there that you have helped to expose social engineering as the top threat to security of organizations today. Tell us a little bit about that because I, I don't think we really grasp the gravity of this. Yeah, that's a really good question. So back, if we go back like eight, nine, ten years ago, when Ooh. I was just starting to write about social engineering, there was still a large bit of exploitation that revolved around software and hardware. So hackers were still getting in through the computers, through the network, uh, through sending a malicious file. Now, yeah. if you jump forward eight years and you come to the, the present day market, software and hardware companies have hardened the network. So it's very difficult for hackers to get in through, through hardware and software. But right. the attacks are still going up. So you look at what's happening and it's all the human. Through phishing, vishing, smishing, and impersonation attacks, we phishing, see... Phishing, smishing. <laughs> oh, these sound very like Yiddish words to me. Yes. <laughs> phishing and smishing and Yiddishing. And... Yeah. So what, what are those? I mean... That, are are those when they send you a, a fake email saying it's your bank, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, so phishing is all email-based attacks. Uh, so it's, a, it's, it's like what you said, maybe I'm from your bank or the new one that's going right now is from Netflix. That's a big one that's happening, um, saying that you're from a Netflix account, need you to log in, and they're getting your, your password and username, logging in, getting your credit card, taking over wow. your Netflix account. Uh, vishing, which is with a V, stands for voice phishing. So it's basically attacks that come when people call you and they say they're the IRS or they're from Microsoft or whatever those scams come in trying to get your financial data. Yeah, uh, I, bet, I, bet, I, I get at least a couple of those a week telling me yeah. that the, the Canadian tax uh, are going to uh, take me to court. Oh, dear. Wow. You're, gonna, oh, you're, you're fortunate. Yeah. I'm popular. You know, you're popular. You've never been arrested yet, have you? <laughs> no, it's amazing. Because no. <laughs> I've owed, apparently, I've gone to these guys, I've owed money for a long time. Yeah. I get them from the IRS, too, all the time, telling me that there I you go. taxes for so, a day. So that's vishing. That's vishing. Uh, smishing is through your cell phone. So like an SMS or text message comes in oh. uh, huge in the banking world right so when whenever a bank gets breached breached you'll see smishing attacks come out say like oh bank of america needs you to log in here to to verify your identity and you click it you log in on what looks like a mobile app but you just give an attackers your username and password for your bank account wow yep yep and then impersonation so phishing. yeah that's smishing uh so sms phishing and then impersonation, because the Ishing guy took a vacation, I guess, is just when they come and break into your building, right? And they, they act like they're an employee or what we're seeing a lot in America. I don't know how this is in Canada. What we're seeing a lot in America is people making believe they're cops and pulling people over or, or issuing or, or stealing um, identities or issuing tickets or in some really sad cases, some really gross men are, are hurting women by making believe they're policemen and pulling them over. Wow. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. That's pretty scary stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, when you think about the fact that, I mean, just as a little sidebar, you think about the fact that there are a lot of people in the United States today who are afraid of the cops, mm -hmm. you know, for, you know, violence that's been done to people, particularly people of color. And then when you see the, you know, and of course there are so many good cops and there's these few yeah. shitheads. And then, you know, you hear these, douchebags doing this stuff of impersonating a policeman and then doing this stuff that's not helping the police force wow not. it's not as wow. a matter of fact um in in a, in a state where i used to live in pennsylvania there was actually a warning issued because people were going to walmart they were buying the blue lights they were pulling they were following women out of parking lots maybe grocery shopping waiting till they were on abandoned roads pulling them over and then hurting them you know hurting them really bad and there was an, a warning issued that, you know, hey, if you're if you feel if a cop's behind you pulling you over, feel free to drive to a well lit parking lot or to a crowded area before you pull over. That's how bad it was getting because they were women were, you know, you're afraid a cop pulls you over. You don't stop. They're going to you, know, you think <laughs> like in a movie you think they're going to get shot or something, you know, but they think you're fleeing. So they were telling right. you if you're alone, it's dark out. You can feel free to drive to a well lit area before you pull over. That's it. So, yeah. I mean, that, that's something, you know, the things you just said there, I mean, what a way to kick off the show. I mean, people yeah. don't even, you know, we're talking about, you know, I think most of us have had some of the experiences you talked about at the first, but now this next level. So how do you help with that? Those kinds of things. 
Yeah, that, that's so. For example, one, like for businesses, you know, since we're talking about leadership roles, the biggest thing that's happening right now around the globe is something called BEC scams. So business email compromise scams, and mm -hmm. it's an attacker looking for a very wealthy company or a wealthy person, and convincing one of their subordinates to do a wire transfer of large sums of money. And we're talking like. Some of the BEC scams have been 50, 60 million, $100 million wire transferred out of accounts. And it's done very simply, either through a, a phishing email or a vishing call or a combination of both of those. So the way we help is we actually test people's employees. So a company will hire us and they say, hey, we wanna see if we're vulnerable to BEC scams. So we'll actually go and we'll fish them. We'll fish them, we'll break in their company. We'll convince one of their people to wire transfer money to an account. But when we do that, we're not the bad guy. So, of course, we return the money. We give it back to them. We tell them, here's how well, we did most it. Of it. Most of it. Yeah, except for maybe a few percentages. I don't know. It got lost in the transfer. Sorry. You know? <laughs> no, no. We never do that. Never, ever do that. No, no I'm maybe, Not on camera, at least. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, we do all these attacks that the bad guys do. And then we come back and say, hey, here's how it worked. Here's how we did it. So now you can go through and you can fix it by doing one, one two, three. Holes. Wow. That's amazing. So, I mean, you know, we're on a subject here, which is sadly very high in the news factor. And, and it's, I want to address it. I'm going to say specifically, but then I'm going to go generally because the specifics of it is, and I'm sure Chris, you've been hammered with this, which is the Russian hackers, you know, the, the potential for the, the elections we've got, you know, as we record here, we're looking at midterms, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and the sort of backdoor stuff that's done through social media. Um, can you tell us the relevance of this, particularly for, with your expertise? Because I think that most people are kind of baffled by this. Sure. Uh, I just read an interesting t statistic that said in spear phishing. So now spear phishing is the same. It's through emails, but it's targeted towards you. So a spear fisher would say, I want to attack Dove. So right. the way they do it, and 91% of the cases is it's personalized, which means they've actually went to your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your Twitter, and they've reviewed all of your social media to develop an attack vector that's personal for you. What are your likes? What are your dislikes? What are your hobbies? What are your passions? And that phishing email will be about that. So to, to answer your question, we look at something like the way – um, hacking could alter a whole election or it could right. alter government is because they're looking at what's being said publicly, what's being done on social media, and they're attacking the core of those people that run those organizations. And as mm -hmm. soon as they can get a foothold in, they can alter anything. I mean, they can alter the, uh, look at what happened. They, they, uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was four or five years ago, a group of hackers hacked the AP, the Associated Press, and they tweeted, uh, a bomb went off on the White House from the Associate Press Twitter account. And the stock market dropped billions of dollars the next day because of a false tweet. So they affected wow. the market for 48 hours. They affected the market because of a fake tweet. So you think about that, that and that's just, a, it, we rebounded, it came back, it was not, you know, everything got fixed. But you think of that, like you can alter the way a whole country is run, the way things work out, the way that people perceive something because of, social media and the way it gets used and, and hacking it. So do you think that, you know, I mean, there's this two sided thing here, which is, you know, the security uh, forces uh, of the U S CIA, FBI, et cetera, et cetera, all say, you know, the Russians hacked to influence the, to influence the uh, elections and uh, are set up to do it again. And maybe actually are already in progress. Um, and there are a bunch of people saying, if it did happen, it doesn't matter. As in, they didn't have any real impact. I want to hear from you as an expert. Do you think it happened and do you think it matters? Well, I can tell you, hands down, every nation state is using hacking as part of warfare right now. It's, just, it's happening across the board. I, I know people who were involved in Stuxnet back in the day, and that was a huge government-sponsored attack to, you know, to, to take over an industry, right? So this is, mm -hmm. this is not, it's not science fiction. Governments are using hacking to attack other governments, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's the United States, it's happening all over the globe. 
Um, and, and does it work? Yeah, it works. I mean, think about, think about what could happen in, in an industry. They, I was just reading an article this morning. It said that after a company gets breached, they have a higher number of people quit or having to get fired because of that. Now it affects yeah. monet it affects a whole Huge. it could affect a, a whole market, right? Yeah. So now you look at that and you take that away from corporate and you say, well, how does it affect government? Well, if you think that your government was uh, put in position by a foreign entity, how much faith can you have in it? Right? How much hope can you have in it? So, it so so with that, Chris, you know, I have to ask, and, and this is, you know, again, you've probably been asked this a lot, but, uh, and if not, I know you will be, and that is, can we trust elections anymore? Hmm. <laughs> that's a really good I know it's, question. That's a, that's a tough question, right? It's, but, it's a tough question. Um, I, can't, I can't answer that 100%. I really can't. What I can tell you no. is that there has been a lot of proof that uh, elections have been altered and that um, there has been a lot of proof about how um, uh, Facebook media, right? So I'm just picking on one that's been all over the of social course. media. Facebook yeah. media across the board has been altered by, by, by fake news, by false, false media, by putting ads out there. Um, everything from, from the election to Black Lives Matter uh, have uh, all across the board have been altered by, by what they claim to be Russian hacking and other types of nation state attacks to alter perception within a whole country of very sensitive and important matters. And it's, it it's does very, work. Yeah, it's very interesting to me because I, as you, you and I had discussed this in a previous conversation off air, I've been involved in, in studying politics and, and some of the darker side of those things for a, 30 years. I'm fascinated by it. And, you know, people, you know, talk about Iran today. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, hold on a second. Do you know the history of Iran? I mean, this is the most civilized country in the world for, for centuries. You know, it is, the, it, it is actually the foundation of, uh, uh, people think that Greece is the foundation. It's actually not. It goes back much earlier. And you look at Iran and, and you look at the coup that was done by the CIA to install the Shah of Iran, um, the, the, Iran was incredibly Western, women in miniskirts, all that kinds of things. Uh, then, the, then the Shah didn't want to behave as well as they liked him to behave. They put him on a plane and said, oh, there's going to be a coup. Uh, don't worry. Then they wouldn't let him land anywhere while they installed an, another coup. And then you've got the Ayatollahs and you've got all the shit that they we're dealing with today because we interfered. And all of that interference, what people don't realize was in the day, what would be equivalent of social media today? They, they put shit in articles and in newspapers and all those kinds of things. And they created, uh, I mean, people are not hard to get into a tribal mentality and, and this. So this is just the same thing, but way faster. The only difference is that instead of it being the CIA or Americans, now Russians and Chinese and Koreans or North Koreans or whoever it may be have the same power. Am I lost in this or is that on target? Absolutely not lost at all. I remember the first time um, I had started doing some overseas travel and I was in India and I'm mm. in the hotel and I turned the TV on and there's a news uh, program from Germany. And at the time, uh, uh, George Bush was the president here in the U S and there was a group of people in Germany who were riding and burning uh, life-size dolls of George Bush wrapped in American flags and they were burning them. And I had no clue what was going on. And I was on the phone with my wife and I said, man, can you believe this news? Like what they're doing over in Germany? And she's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, you have to be able to see it. It's, it's all over the news. And she's like, I don't know what you're talking. I'm like, go to CNN. It's got to be front page. Nothing in American right. media about this whole event over in Europe where they were burning dolls. And I'm like, it was the first time, it was literally like one of my first times where I'm sitting there going, whoa, my, my mind's a little blown. Like you're telling me that you're yeah. not getting this. I'm watching yeah. this live happening. You're not getting it there. And it, it was the first time I started to realize, wow, the alteration of what we are allowed to take in as news and media. But that's happy. the key, isn't it? What you just yep. said, what we're allowed. Wow. Yep. Right? So we are fed, you know, we, we used to talk about the Fox bubble, but you know, I say to people, we all live in a bubble and we're all, and particularly with social media, because social media is designed to feed you what you like. Yes. And, and that's why I watch Al Jazeera. That's why I watch Russian TV. And that's why I watch the BBC as well as a little bit of Fox occasionally and even yep. some CNN, because I want that big perspective 
and then independent journalists, which are increasingly difficult to find. But that because of that, you know, people just go, oh, you know, I got my, I mean, you know, I was just watching this with John Oliver last night and he was saying that in Burma, the internet and Facebook are interchangeable. So people use, people get their news from Facebook and they refer to Facebook as the internet. That is so, so dangerous, isn't it? Well, it's created, it's created uh, Islamic phobia and, and uh, the Rahand, Rahandis and all those are being persecuted because of it. So it's, it's fascinating, this lack of understanding of how we are manipulated. Now, that coming into there, you know, about how we are manipulated, uh, I just want to say this to, to our viewers and our listeners, because I think that you're going to get some, some real grasp and understanding of the depth of Chris here. Because Chris and I got talking a, a long time back, and you're probably thinking, well, you know, why would I have this guy on a you know, leadership show? Because... A, as a leader, you are subject to this, number one, at a personal security level. Your company is subject to it, number two, um, at a corporate level. But number three is understanding that this manipulation of people and the challenge with it was. So uh, as a listener, as a viewer, you, you may remember a show on TV called Lie to Me. I, I loved that show. Uh, Tim, Tim uh, what was his name? Uh, Tim, Tim Roth. Roth. Tim Roth, yeah. Great actor. I love Tim Roth. Always plays an asshole. Does a great job. <laughs> he does, too, uh, doesn't he? he always. Oh, it's kind of his character role, right? <laughs> like, yeah, it's, 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 it's not like that in real life, he, but he just does it great. And, yeah. and in, in the show Lie to Me, his work is based on, on somebody called Dr. Paul Ekman. Now, mm. one of the areas that you and I talked about uh, before we recorded was where we have crossover is that we've both done the study of uh, nonverbal behaviors, uh, uh, and of course, Ekman, that's his specialty. Uh, you're certified expert level graduate from Dr. Ekman in micro expressions, in his micro expressions course. Tell us a little bit about that because for the person on the surface, like, okay, uh, you're dealing with hackers and you can't <laughs> see their faces. Yeah. You sure as hell can't see their micro expressions. What's the tie in? Or are you just some nerd like me who loves <laughs> learning weird, wonderful shit? <laughs> so, so interestingly enough, um, um, I have a very small podcast uh, compared to you, and I wanted to get Dr. Ekman on the show. And it was, it was and you were able to do it, and I, and I was able to do it. <laughs> this, this was years ago, though, and I, I, because it was a passion, like you. I think at the time I was a nerd, and I was just like, oh man, this is just so awesome to be able to understand this. And after I had him on the show, I had this thought of, could we blend? the 50 plus years of his research with my industry. So I, I called him and I said, I'd love to talk to you about doing that exact thing. And he said, okay, come fly out and let's talk. So I got to meet him, got to sit with Dr. Ekman, got to talk and you know, year and a half, two years later, we ended up writing a book together that did just that. It blended all of his research with how it applies to hacking. So the, the concept is we make decisions very much based on our emotions and our feelings. And Absolutely. our emotions and feelings are altered by, uh, back to our, our discussion a minute ago, by what we see and perceive, by what we're allowed to take in, but also by other people. So if you mm -hmm. were sitting here and you and I were talking and you were looking angry the whole time, I would be like, what am I doing wrong? Why am I taking dick, dove off? What, what's happening? You know? And I would be concerned about that what I'm saying is not what you want to hear. Um, and you, you don't have to tell me. You don't have to say like, oh man, I'm mad at you. I would just see it in your face. Of I'm course. Thinking, I can make a motion exist in you by what I show on my face and my body. So I thought this is a way to hack humans, right? If we can overload your ability to feel emotion by what I want to portray to you by controlling my emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how it ties in to human hacking. So you're right. In phishing emails, maybe we're not seeing the person, but our nonverbals affect us when we're on the phone. And when you're sitting on the phone, if you're smiling, your voice is higher pitched. It sounds different than if you're frowning. It sounds lower. And, 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 and if you're angry, it even sounds more ter tense and terse. Right. So our nonverbals affect our, our voice on the phone. When we're impersonating, actual coming and breaking in a company, our nonverbals go a long way to either show confidence that we belong or to show fear. So our nonverbals are very important from a human hacker perspective. But now taking it to the to the, ma the management, the uh, excellence level, that C level, is also trying to tell people how to use their nonverbals when they're defending. 
right? So I, I, honestly, when I walk into a building and I'm looking at a row of security guards, I pick the one that's got his hands in his pockets and his shoulders down. And I'm like, that's the guy who's going to be the weakest, not the security guard who's standing, you know, standing up like this. And it's like, that's the guy who's confident. He knows, he knows what he's doing. I'm not going after him. I'm going to go over to the security guard that looks like he doesn't care about his job and just having a boring day. So nonverbals do a lot to exude to the public, to who people see you on what your stance is and how, how secure you may be or how vulnerable you may be. Yeah, it's, uh, I'll tell you a funny story of this. Um, I was in New York with a friend of mine. Uh, I was there for, for Book Expo America and we were there to get him a publishing deal. We were just hanging out. We're hanging out with a bunch of publishers and editors and, and we got invited to, to this party. Um, but it was a tickets only private party. Um, with, and one of the, the, the guy, the last living guy from the Ramones was playing and it was actually his last gig before he died. So we had, you know, so it was, it was in this big place and, you know, there was uh, four doormen on the front and it was, and we didn't have tickets, you know, so we were invited, but we don't have tickets. Right. And it's me and my mate and, and, and two other people who were with us. And, and Lee's like, Oh, you know, I just heard somebody say, you got to have a ticket. Well, one, cause we don't have tickets. How are we going? I said, follow me. <laughs> and he goes, what do you mean? I said, all four, all three of you just follow me, do exactly as I do and do not falter. And they're like, okay. Uh, and, and my friend Lee calls it, I use the force. <laughs> he used the force. Uh, and I just walk and I walk up and I, I actually look for the guy who will make eye contact with me. And I do an animal. <laughs> you stare down an animal and you are unflinching. That animal backs away, <laughs> no matter how confident it is. Right. And I just go up and I've, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not super tall. You know, I do have a physique and I do have a face that kind of looks like you might don't want to piss with me, you know, but I just look at him, give him, look him in the eye, give him a smile, give him a nod and walk in. Yeah. And they walked in right behind me and they get inside of my mate's like, you use the force. And I go, no, I just paid attention. <laughs> That's right. And he goes to what? And, I, and it was before I knew anything about all that stuff. Right. And I said, to what? And I said, just to know who to go to. Yeah. And actually, I go the other way. You know, you talked about the slump. I go to the strongest, most confident guy. Because uh -huh. I'm like, yeah, if I, I know that I can go through him, nobody will question me. Right. Because he'll look and go. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So well, it's the same thing, but it's paying that's attention. That's engineering, in essence. What you just did, that's, you, can now, you can now take my job and break into buildings for a living. <laughs> well, it's, it's one of the things, right? It's like, you know, and it's one of my questions to you. Um, I'll actually ask you right now. It was later in the show, but I want to ask you, what is one of the things you do that other people see as easy hmm. that you know is not easy that maybe was very difficult for you, but other people see it as like, it's easy for you. That's a great, that's a great question. Wow. Something that other people view as easy that I know is very difficult. You know, I think um, um, if I had to go back from a business perspective, I'd have to say that just starting in this industry, when I, when I started social engineering as a job, there was absolutely nobody doing it solely as a career. There was no. nobody. I mean, there was people that were doing some SE as part of their pen testing, you know, penetration testing business. But when I remember the day I came home and I said to my wife, so I want to do this thing. I want to start this company. I want to call it social engineer genius enough. I know. And I want to just focus on the human aspect. And she's like, great. How many people are doing it? And I'm like, well, None. <laughs> She's like, so how do you know you're going to make money? And I'm like, I don't. I just have a feeling. I have a feeling that this is the future. This is the way hacking is going to go. And she was like, okay, let's give it a try. And now I jump forward 10 years and it seems like every day there's a couple hundred people putting the shingle out front saying I do social engineering. And I think that is something that I can look at and say it was very hard to start this. It was something that was brand new. Nobody was doing it. It wasn't, I remember we would go to a pen test and I would say, hey, we should try some fishing on the pen test. I'm like, ah, no one's going to fall for that. We don't want to try it. And I'd be like, I'll give you some for free, you know, like trying to just get the service right. out there. And they still like, ah, I'm not really that interested. And now to come forward to where, you know, I, I literally turn work away at times because the client, sure. will come and they just want a compliance test. And I'm like, ah, we don't do compliance tests you know, go somewhere else and we'll turn it away because now that it's the biggest vector. It's what everyone's looking for. So it yeah. looks easy now, but it was really hard to start this industry when we first started a decade ago. 
Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing, right, is that a lot of these things, that they, they, they start off, I mean, it's really pushing a rock uphill, and then, yeah. and then it gets to that top, and everybody, every man and his dog's talking about it, and, you know, like, oh, yeah, we knew that. And I always yeah. hear, oh, yeah, we knew that. Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. We were I always a fan. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Where were you a decade ago? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's the name of the book, though, isn't it? Uh, so my you newest book is Social Engineering, The Science of Human Hacking. Right. Yep. That's my newest so, book. So, right. When did, that, when did that one come up? Oh, boy. Just, just uh, July. So it's not even a, sure. it's like a month and a half old. Okay. Very good. Okay. So we, we have to make sure that everybody knows about that. Where can people find out about that book? So it's all over Amazon, of course. And, and I actually saw it recently in some, uh, there, there's, I think there's two or three left in the world, actual brick and mortar bookstores. <laughs> At least, I don't know, maybe in Canada, there's more in America. Yeah. They've gone yeah. by the way of the Dodo. They're no longer yeah. existent, you know? Yeah. Um, they were hacked by Amazon. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then Amazon bought all their stock and sells it for real cheap online. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, so, it's, it's, it's up there. So, you know, you talked about that, the difficulty of, of starting a new industry, really. I mean, you know, it wasn't even a new niche. It was a new industry. Um, but, you know, for me, when I look at human beings, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, Chris, because we talked about it, I think, on your show, when I was honored to be a guest on your show, that, as you know, I fell off a mountain, got smashed up. And, and one of the things that people will often ask me is, did that change your life? You know, it must have changed your life. And the answer is it didn't. Um, it, it didn't change my life. It changed, not at the time. It definitely changed my life later, but not at the time. And, you know, we talked about those moments are not really what happens where it really changes. What was a turning point in your life? Because I believe that everybody has a fall. Some are yeah. literal, like, you know, like me, who are less than bright. Uh, but some people are not quite as daft as I am. So what was the turning point in your life, in your leadership, in your sort of business philosophy? I love that question. So there was a time where winning was so important to me that it didn't matter how the client felt or how anyone around me felt as long as I won. And winning to me meant that I was 100% successful. So if you hired me to break into your building, uh, it didn't matter how your people felt, how you felt, I had to break in. If you hired me to fish, I had to get all the fish out into there and get people clicking. And that led me to forgetting at one point that I was a professional. And that as a professional, although you're hiring me to do things that bad guys do, as a professional, I need to remember my, my mantra, which I didn't have at the time, which is leave them feeling better for having met you. Now, the, the, the turning point for me was I had a job. We, we, had, we were doing fishing, fishing, and, and breaking in. And fishing, man, we failed miserably. Like people were not clicking the link. A couple of people clicked, they turned it in, we were shut down. Vishing, we tried a number of different techniques and nothing worked. Um, we were dropping USB keys at the time. We had, actually, this is a later before, so we were dropping DVDs. I was labeling them everything from bonuses to porn. That was always, always get people to open them up. Nobody, they were turning them all into the IT department. At that point, I should have went, wow, you guys are amazing. But instead, I took it to a level where I, I forced a situation using manipulation instead of influence. And I took a, a female coworker with me on site and I berated her and screamed at her and yelled at her and cut her down in front of a group of men who then wanted to come beat me up and we had her defend me. Stockholm syndrome, right? So now they're looking at her like this poor abused woman. I leave and she starts crying saying that she just was there to get her job done and she didn't get it done. It wasn't her fault. I was righteous for yelling at her. Everyone feel bad, feels bad for her and they fill out these forms where they're putting all their, their employee numbers and social security numbers and now we won. Now when I'm going for the report meeting, I'm walking in like the big man, you know, I won. This is what you paid me for. But everybody hates me because I was this guy who berated a woman publicly. And it had mm -hmm. this massive effect on me where I went, you know, winning at the cost of what? Like I won, but it was at the cost of making everyone around me feel bad. At, what's the learning lesson? Don't be, a, don't be a human. Don't be a compassionate, empathetic person. Where's the education? So that to me was my fall. That was my fall. I hit rock bottom. I got back up and I said, I got to figure something out. I got to do things differently. And that's when I came up with the mantra, leave them feeling better for having met you. Um, and I said, can you do this job 
can I hack people for a living and never use negative pretexts? And that became my goal. And that turned everything from my very first book, which was Social Engineering, The Art of Human Hacking, and to my latest book, which was Social Engineering, The Science of Human Hacking, and learning how to do this on a scientific level with not hurting the target person. And that, that, was, a, that was a massive change for me. You know, that's, that's, that's fascinating for me. Um, you know, you and I had talked about my, my work and that, you know, that the idea, I think that the idea of soft skills is a really stupid idea. Mm. Um, and I make no bones about that because um, if we don't have those skills, we don't have anything and everything goes down the toilet. But you're in an industry where you kind of have to have them feel bad, right? You know, like they got to kind of get the potential negative consequences of not hiring you or someone like you to understand their security systems. So it's fascinating to me how you were able to do that. How do you sell? Because, I mean, again, my perception, you kind of have to sell fear. You know, either clear the shit up or the Russian government are going to be running the U.S., you know, the, the, the White House. Yeah. Uh, clean this shit up or they're going to be running Congress. You know, clean this stuff up or else they're going to be uh, hacking your bank account in your company and sending $50 million to a Nigerian prince. You know, <laughs> it seems to be fear-based. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you get around that, Chris. Yeah, yeah I love it. Very so, interesting. So let me give you two scenarios. So let's say... Yeah. Uh, again, I'm going to go back. You hired me to break into your building. Right. And, uh, and I'm going to give you a real scenario that we did. So we did a little research in the area and your building right next door, there's a big construction project. And this news report had issued, um, uh, this literal news report said that because of the construction, it was bringing up these spiders that normally come out in spring and they burrow underground and they lay their hay and, and, and they come, usually come out in spring. Well, they were coming out in late winter because of this construction project. So they were non-threatening, not bad, not poisonous. They were just a lot of them. So I developed a pretext where I was a pest control person. And mm -hmm. I'm going to go break into your company. Now, think about this. Now, here's, where, here's, the, here's the difference to answer your question. I can walk up to the secretary, who I know most people have a fear of spiders, and I can tell her, I'm here to spray for spiders because there are these horrible poisonous spiders that could kill your employees if I don't spray. And that's going to elicit a fear that's like, oh, my gosh, we better do this. Or I can say, hey, you know about the construction next door? Here's the article. You see it in the paper. We were sent out to spray for these spiders so, you know, you don't have any problems here. And, and then she goes, oh, my God, I, I don't want – well, don't worry. They're not dangerous, but we just need to get rid of them because they'll infest everything. So now, did I elicit a little bit of fear? I certainly did. But instead of eliciting a life-and-death reaction that shuts down – her critical thinking, right? So in our brains, we have this little piece of gray matter called the amygdala, and it processes emotional stimuli before our brain can kick in. The amygdala can be hijacked to create a situation where logic thought doesn't exist. If I created intense fear, she makes a decision based out of intense fear and no logic. So now when it's all over, how do I train her? To not have fear? That doesn't work. So by using a light amount of fear, not death, life and death fear, I can now come back and say, ah, you see what you should have done is verify that I was on the list. You should have verified that I had authorization. Was I really from your pest control company? There's a lot of things that I can now educate her on to stop the next guy that will do that without having to walk in and just punch her straight in the face. So it's <laughs> softening the fear. <laughs> It, yeah, I think that's a, that's a nice way of putting it. It's softening it. Like, you know, we send phishing emails and we'll say something like, um, um, you know, uh, we, we don't use Amazon, but let's just use it since we talked about them. Sure. You know, um, thank you for your recent Amazon order of this 57 inch screen TV. And that's like, oh, I didn't order a TV, you know, click here to log in and, and check your order. And people are like, oh my gosh, I didn't do that. Let me go check my, my Amazon account. And they click the button, they log in, they realize it's a fish. Uh, whereas saying, you know, your bank account has been emptied, you know, or something, you know, thank you. We have your ATM card. Here's your credit card number. We've hacked your bank. There's two different types of fear there, and one disables and creates this enormous void, and the other goes, man, that's a little irritating. Let me go check that out. So we tend to try to lean towards the, the softened uh, part of those emotions. Now, with that said, 
there are times where you have to use, you have to, right? So you brought up one, talking about nation state attacks. We did, oh. we did a big test for a, a government agency and, um, and with an armed facility. You can't, you can't use softened fear no. with those places because no. you're the, who, what you're protecting is different than what I'm protecting yeah, when I'm just talking about your telecom company. Right. So I, you have to think about too, where, you know, what, the what context. are the people? Yep. Your context, the people, the pretext, everything you're protecting. And that, that determines how far we go. So, you know, we're, we're in the last part of the show here and I, I, there's actually you and I, you know, we know this from our previous conversation. We could go for hours. Yeah, we could, <laughs> but we could. Um, but let's just go to one simple question right now. Simple for me to ask and maybe not so simple to answer, which is we're talking about all these potential threats, but what can we do? Because, you know, if somebody sends me an email says, you know, Oh, you're 57 inch TV. I go, I didn't order that. Um, is the best thing to do ignore it? Mm, that's a great question. There's, there's a couple things that can be done, right? So in that case, uh, what I would suggest, and that in the case that you just gave with the email, don't click on anything in the email. Open up a browser, go to amazon.com, log into your account, and see if there's an actual order there. And wow. if there's no order, then go, ah, oh, that was just a spam email, and you can delete it and move on, right? Or report right. it to your IT company if you're at, at a business. Uh, and the case of where you're being approached by someone and you, you know, maybe you have to make a decision quickly. I tell people that, and Daniel Goldman in his book about emotional intelligence that talks about amygdala hijacking, he brings up yeah. just a, a short pause, something as quick as 20 or 30 seconds, which may seem forever, allows your brain to stop thinking emotionally and return back to critical thinking. And sometimes people just need to step away from the email or put the call on hold or step away from the front desk and say, I, excuse me, yes, I'll be right back. Let that emotion go away so they can critically think about what the next step is. That one thing alone could, could make all the difference. And we tell people education and critical thinking are two of the biggest things to combat um, cyber attacks and social engineering attacks. Yeah. And I, I want to give everybody a tip on it too, because when that stress happens, as you said, the amygdala gets hijacked. Uh, 27% of the blood flow to the frontal lobe, which is a cognitive thinking, stops. So you're 27% dumber in those situations. Not you, me, all of us, right? Yes. So yep. one of the key things you can do, uh, and it's is, is to remove eye contact if it's a physical person, is to remove eye contact because we feel, because of social pressure, we feel we're being rude. So as you just said, uh, excuse me, I just got to go in the back for something. And if you can walk away for, for 10, 20 seconds and focus only in on your breath, your brain will come back, that 27% blood flow. And it can come back just enough to say, I'm not sure about this. Mm -hmm. um, I have to check. That's all you need to do. So that's a really important thing. Because as you said, it's very important. You've got to get your brain back online. And we've all been under those pressures. And and you should know if somebody's doing that in your face directly, they are trained to push you. They are trained to keep you in fear. That's why when the IRS or, or Canada Revenue Services contacts you, they say, if you don't respond to this, you know, you will be taken to court. They don't say, you know, I, you know, it will probably be all right. So <laughs> it's really important to remember those things. And you know, it's easy to, I mean, I had that reaction when I forgot the very first one. I was like, oh shit, really? So what I do, I didn't call them back. I called my accountant and said, is that true? No. Oh, okay, good. Right. So it, it's very important. Um, little sidebar for a moment. What's the best piece? Because a lot of what you're doing is guiding people in ways that they don't normally get guided. So what would you say is something that um, the best piece of counterintuitive advice you've ever received? Huh. Counterintuitive advice. Um, so when I work with large companies, a lot of times they feel the solution to the problem is to find the weakest person or persons, fire them and hire new persons. The mm. problem is, is that this, this situation is human. 
just like you identified in, in what you were saying previously, you can fall for it. I can fall for it because you also have an amygdala. I have an amygdala. You have a frontal lobe. I have a frontal lobe. We both have blood flow. So we're humans. And whatever our right. triggers are, we can fall for the same attacks as the next person. So when you find the weak link in your company, unless they're doing something illegal or terrible to hurt you, you fire them, you replace them with the new human. That new human is just as vulnerable as the old human. There's not a human 2.0 yet. So we're not, you know, there's no upgrade. So it's, it's to me, the counterintuitive is, um, is to look for the situation, look for the problem and blame it on the person and to not look and say, you know what, this is actually my fault because maybe as a leader or a business owner, I haven't put enough time, effort, energy, money into making my company stronger. And in essence, I'm blaming the, the, the soldiers for having a weak army when really it's the general that needed to be taking the lead and showing the proper way of making it work. And that seems a little yeah. counterintuitive because even as a company owner myself, uh, when something bad happens, it's easy to blame, blame the person who just messed it up. And it's harder to sit back and go, okay, did I add to this problem at all? What, what, what can I do to fix it? Where, where was the flaw started? You know, there's an interesting piece in there, what you just said. Um, Cause when I think about it now in that context, I go, do I fire the person who screwed up and, re and replace them with somebody else? Hmm. Or do I look at that person now as an asset? Because they yeah. will certainly be more cautious. For the sure. new person may not be as cautious. So the counterintuitive might be to say, no, you keep the person who screwed up because they know the gravity. Yeah. So my job is to really clearly explain the gravity of the situation not to fire them, but to give them the gravity of it because, because they've already felt the sting. They are likely, and actually maybe even put them in charge of training somebody else. They may actually become my best person for this. Mm -hmm. I've done exactly that. We had a, a situation where we were doing a bunch of fishing calls and fishing attacks and one woman who fell for the fish and we had called her to see if we could further the attack and she got really upset and she, she caught us in the middle of it and she stopped us and we told the company, make her your security advocate internally. And she got a new job at training departments on how to defend against it. And they were like, why? You know, at first they were like, why? And I'm like, because she's your best person right now. She fell for yep. the attacks. She eventually caught it. Let's put her in charge of telling all the other people because she has a real story. She could sit back and yeah. say, I fell for these things. I, I did this. I clicked that link. And then I was able to stop it. Here's my story. So that story mm. will resonate with those people way more than hearing that you fired someone because they fell for it. That's just going to breed a, the wrong kind of fear through the company. That's fascinating. So, Chris, uh, you know, you and I are big learners. Uh, we, we love learning. Uh, I believe that. Uh, leaders are learners, you know, and and more than anything, actually uh, learning about ourselves and growth and development of who we are. Um, and I think that a lot of people who are coming up as leaders or old school leaders often think, well, you know, there's a place you get to it and I'm there now. Um, and I, I think those of us who are smarter know that that's just not the case. I always want to encourage people, our viewers, our listeners to to grasp that learning and continuing to learn is important. What is one thing that you, you're still working on in yourself, in your leadership, in your growth, and in your company? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm big into something called DISC, which is a communication profiling tool. It tells us how we like to communicate with other people and how mm -hmm. we like to be communicated with. And my profile is very high D and then secondary I, which means I'm a very direct communicator that can also be outgoing and humorous and persuasive and things like that, which fits my job really, really well. But under stress, my communication profile turns almost into what my employees call the incredible Hulk, you know, where I just smash everything in my path and, you know, clean up the mess later. And uh, for me, what I'm working on is learning to recognize when that communication profile is becoming too aggressive and learning to temper it back and to use the strengths of it. I had a great friend that used to say, um, exploit the strengths and train the weakness. And, mm -hmm. and that, that's, that's been a mantra of mine recently is to look at that communication profile, profile for myself. How can I exploit those strengths and how can I, how can I train my weaknesses? So that's something I've been working on quite a bit lately. Very cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm a great believer. Um, what I talk to everybody about is if you take a coin and if it goes up as heads and comes down as tails, it's not two separate coins. <laughs> it's just two sides of the same coin. 
And therefore, every blessing is a curse and every curse is a blessing. Mm. You just have to pay attention to when it's which. So oh as a direct communicator like you, I'm a direct communicator. Uh, I like that about myself. I enjoy that about myself. I don't bullshit people. And I'm very playful and all those kinds of things. But when I'm pissed off, that can be like yeah. kind of threatening, particularly yeah. with this face, right? Yeah. So it can same be thing. I got the same problem. <laughs> so, you know, resting asshole face, yeah. not so good. Uh, it's mine, not yours. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, not me so, too. <laughs> so it's very interesting that, that uh, to, to, to know those things about ourselves, it's, yeah. it's vital for us. So tell us, what's a guilty pleasure for Chris? <laughs> wow. Um, whiskey, <laughs> whiskey, <laughs> whiskey. I love whiskey. So I've been to Scotland three or four times. Um, every time we, we go, I go as a family, we pick a region and we rent a car and we just drive and we just ah. visit, we visit the woods, the distilleries, the ocean, the, the, and, but we always stop at as many distilleries as we can stop at. Um, and that's just a, that's a guilty pleasure. I love, I love whiskey. I uh, love the country, Scotland, where, where it originated from. So it's, uh, yeah, I would say that's probably my biggest one. That's very interesting. Have you tried any of the, the award-winning Japanese whiskeys? Yes. As a matter of fact, looking over at my shelf here, I have five or six sitting right there. Yeah, I, w I actually don't drink whiskey. Um, I'm not a whiskey fan. Mm -hmm. uh, mine's Añejo Tequila. And uh -huh. I like, you know, but, you know, very specific sipping tequilas, you know, et cetera. Yes. Um, and I've gotten many of my Scotch friends over on to tequila because they're like, this is good. Yeah. Right? Um, but a friend of mine who I did that to him, he's like, well, you got to try this. I'm like, what is it? He goes, it's Japanese whiskey. I'm like, come on. You mean it's like a sake? He's like, no, it's Japanese whiskey. No. Yeah. He goes, it's won all these awards. I was like, oh my God, this is actually yeah. good. I actually yeah. like this. So when I go to his place, and Japanese, it's, I don't know what it is. Yeah. I can't remember the names, but he's actually given me a few. And he brings them back when he goes there on business. And mm -hmm. they're, they're extraordinary. The Japanese are amazing at what they did. So if you look back at the history, um, one of the first distilleries, original distilleries in Japan, they actually sent a Japanese guy to Scotland. He ended up living there for a couple decades, married a Scottish woman, uh, worked under one of the great Scots, uh, Scot, Scotch makers, learned the whole process, came back to Japan and started uh, just perfecting that's a japanese do with everything they yeah, take exactly. something that's a process and they perfect it and yeah. every bottle of their whiskey just is just it is amazing it's sweet it's uh, some of it's smoky it could just it could have so many profiles yeah beautiful yeah. stuff and you were right it could some of the award-winning stuff could be quite expensive too but really nice oh yeah yeah, yeah. It is. well thank you for sharing that with us yeah not if, as we close up as we finish give our listeners our viewers a single piece of practical advice that they can put in action that really are going to allow them to really get what it is you you've been sharing with us today to really have them take it home, put it in action in the next, preferably next 24 hours, but certainly in the next few days. Sure. So from, from a business perspective, whenever you feel emotional about any interaction, so you get an email and it triggers an emotion. You get a phone call, it triggers an emotion. You meet a person, it triggers an emotion. You look at your text message, it triggers an emotion. Do exactly what you and I talked about. Stop what, looking at whatever it is. So if it's a person, remove eye contact. If it's the email or text, remove that. Put, put the call on hold and take 10 to 30 seconds to just pause. And if you do that, I guarantee you, you will see a massive reduction in how vulnerable you are to attack. It's such a simple thing that most people go, it can't work. It seems so stupid. And then a lot of people also go, yeah, but we're so busy. I don't know if I have 20 or 30 seconds every time I feel emotional. Well, I guarantee you the cleanup from getting hacked will take way longer than the 20 or 30 seconds you need in order to return to critical thinking and save yourself from a breach. You know what? That is such simple and powerful and practical advice. And by the way, you know, we're talking about hacking and fishing and smishing and schmushing and <laughs> schmoozing and all those kinds of things. But let me just tell you, use that technique with your partner. Mm. When, you're, when your beloved pisses you off, uh -huh. your mom told you, count to 10 yep. <laughs> before you open your big fat mouth and say something stupid. 
Well, it, it's the same rule. <laughs> yes. It works. <laughs> it works so good. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> and just get yourself away. Yeah. And that's all it takes. Be willing to say, I want to talk about that, but I just got to go pee. Yeah. <laughs> that's what you have to say. I yep. want to talk about that, but I just got to go pee. Go in the bathroom. If you don't need to pee, run the water, right. look in the mirror, and breathe. Come back 10, 15 seconds later, and guess what? You won't be getting divorced. Yeah. <laughs> I love but it. If or you keep letting your lips flap, <laughs> yeah, you might end up in a course. Yeah. yeah. Great advice. It's, it's been this great having like, you here, Chris. The it really has. And marriage podcast. Exactly. That's what it is. <laughs> Please tell our viewers, our listeners, where they can find out more about you, about the book, about all the things that you're doing, Chris. Okay. okay. So I have a bunch of websites. I have uh, social-engineer.com, which is our corporate site. I have the social-engineer.org, which is a bunch of free things like a newsletter, podcast uh, framework. And then our Innocent Lives Project is at innocentlivesfoundation.org which you can find out information about basically everything that I'm doing from one of those three websites. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. That's awesome. I'm just going to make sure we've got the other one down there as well. That's great. Well, we will, of course, we will, uh, we will uh, post those for you. We'll share those on the show notes pages for everybody. Chris, it has been an absolute pleasure and honor having you here, mate. I really enjoyed it. I, and I want to thank you for having me on your show. That was a joy too. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much great stuff. And I'm sure that we, you and I will have lots more to talk about as time goes by. Thank you. Thank you, Dove. And you, dear listener, remember, dear viewer, remember that you can now chat about the show that you've been listening to or any past episodes by going to our Facebook page. Just go to the Dove Baron Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. And there you can chat with our previous guests, and you can chat with other listeners about what it is that you like about the show, what it is you got out of it. Because remember, the information's with the hole in the donut. Put it in an application. And remember, the research consistently shows that one of the biggest challenges facing the most successful companies can be somewhat counterintuitive. And these fast-growing companies often hit a point where they realize that they are spending a fortune attracting, training, and developing talent, only to have them leave at an alarming rate. If you're sick of investing in training and developing your talent, only having them leave before you get your ROI, then come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose. Fullmontyleadership.com providing you with the concrete soft skills to get you and your organization to the top and keep you there. Why? Because you can't outsource authenticity. And also remember to stop by The Matrix, matrix.fullmontyleadership.com. You don't need the triple W dot. Just go to matrix.fullmontyleadership.com and get your matrix self-assessment tool. It'll test you in the five areas of leadership so you can see where your real strengths are and what it is you need to build up on. Remember, you can also find us on Google Play and on Alexa by simply saying, Play Dove Baron Podcast. Thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time. Get yourself over to Amazon, uh, get yourself over, not Amazon, but iTunes, and rate and review the show. We really appreciate that. We love it when you do that. Until next time, this is Dove Baron saying, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about you and your social engineering. How are you being manipulated, fished, schmished, and schmooshed? And really remember, what it takes is about 10 seconds to bring your brain back online. This was a great show with Chris, and I want you to take action on what it is. I'm Dove Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out. <laughs>